and um, the government business partnership um, against the rest of us, big business, big government, uh, and warfare and militarism and the national security state and the, the um, we're number one. Chest beating business, I mean, you know, the waving the flag and uh, uh, I'm sick and tired, I must say, of the U.S. flag. Which was originally, of course, the military. If I can get off, <laughs> what do I lose everybody in the audience? But you know, this is originally, of course, and legally still is the military banner of the U.S. government. And in, in the more constitutional days, it flew only over U.S. military posts. In the Civil War, Lincoln and uh, made great use of bunting and the flags. And with each war, we've seen an increasing, increasing uh, flagomania, as I've called it, um, where it's today illegal to touch the flag to the ground. It's illegal to fly the flag at night without a light on it. It's illegal to dispose of the flag uh, except by folding it in a certain way and burning it or burying it. Um, and of course, they want to make it illegal to burn the flag otherwise if your attitude's wrong. But uh, uh, so we see, you know, and I, I noticed first with Bush and Cheney and now continuing in this administration, what's with the masked flags that appear behind any U.S. politician? I mean, it looks like Mussolini to me. I mean, what is that? I mean, it used to be they had one was sufficient. That was bad enough. But now I notice Obama's backed by nine. It's like the lictors of the Roman, you know, the Roman consul or something. It's a very, uh, very alarming business. So, again, this is all nationalism. What we remember, you guys don't remember, but after 9-11, um, you were sort of questioned if you didn't, didn't have a flag magnet on your car. And uh, a lot of people had two flags flying from the, the mirrors. And that proved that you were a good guy and, you know, you weren't a terrorist because you were flying the flag and go kill them. Of course, no evidence that anybody in Iraq, had, and of course, nobody had ever done anything to us. Nobody in, you know, in, 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 even in Afghanistan, what the, the, uh, uh, those uh, 19 guys were trained in uh, uh, Florida and in New Jersey. <laughs> so I guess the good thing was they didn't bomb those places. Um, <laughs> But again, they, the U.S. just thinks, because of nationalism, thinks we are the superior group. Uh, everybody else is an, un, is, is an underperson. And so I think I would put the, the, this, this uh, war business, which destroyed or at least stopped the, the advance of classical liberalism in the 19th century, too, war. And the feeling that uh, our side's right, we can kill everybody on the other side. And, and then, of course, leading to the wars of the 20th century is the most horrific wars in the history of the human race. Um, and with the erasure of the difference between soldiers and civilians so that uh, it's perfectly legitimate to just bomb cities, uh, bomb cities full of unresisting old people and children and, uh, and, and women, uh, as in the, you know, the case in Germany and in Japan. Um, what they were the wrong, they both, you know, had the wrong, the wrong citizenship, kill them all. So this is uh, not... I, uh, I'm always, I find myself, as I get older, tending more, more towards almost pacifism. But certainly if one is going to have a war and have a, have a just war, um, then, uh, as St. Augustine wrote so many centuries ago, um, you can't deliberately target non-combatants. This is just murder. So the U.S. government is, is in effect, a murder machine. Maybe all governments are murder machines. Uh, the British government in its imperial days, certainly the German government, obviously the Soviet governments. Um, there have been many murder machines in the history of the human race. But I think, I think the feeling, and this was even true, this was true of the Romans, the feeling that they were um, blessed by the gods to be the rulers of the, of the known world. Uh, Americans today feel that, too many of them, that God, that America is the new Zion. There have been these unfortunate tendencies since the pilgrims that we're the new Zion, anybody standing against us, whether it's the Indians then or um, Muslims today, just kill them all. They can just be killed because uh, we're the chosen of God. We can just kill anybody that uh, um, stands against us. That's very, very unfortunate. And I don't exactly know what's to be done about it except the kinds of things that Bumper Hornberger keeps doing and teaching the truth and trying to explain to people why uh, these kinds of wars are bad morally, why they're bad from a utilitarian standpoint, why they increase the power of the state so dramatically. Uh, war, of course, has been the great friend of state power. 
and uh, it shuts everybody up, and it makes dissent a crime, and it makes uh, loving the government and doing exactly what the government wants you to do a virtue. Uh, so in other words, it turns things on its head. Um, so all we can keep do is telling the truth, uh, saying that war is, uh, I'll, I'll just finish up by quoting Joe Sobrin, you mentioned conservatives. Uh, the conservatives, he said, are opposed to big government unless it's killing people. So that's, uh, that's the people that listen to, you know, Limbaugh and Hannity, I'm afraid. Here, yeah. here. So. Um, back to uh, economics. Uh, this morning on my uh, news feed, I saw an article in the New York Times that was headlined, Why Did So Many Economists Get, get It Wrong? Referring to the, to the downturn. And a part of me had hoped that the ghost of Henry Hazlitt was, was back at the Times and that he would respond. But sadly enough, uh, I don't believe it was Greenspan, but I, I, I don't think so. But in any case, sadly enough, it ends up that the cure, that, that the reason so many got it wrong, according to the Times, is that capitalism, uh, the, the economists had too much faith in, in laissez-faire capitalism. They... Uh, they didn't realize, they, they overlooked the fact that capitalist enterprises get out of, uh, go, go out of control and go after people and all the predation that's involved. And I guess my point in bringing up all of that is in light of that kind of sophistry that you get from the mainstream press, uh, what, what gives you hope? Well, I think, you know, before I get to the subject of hope, I think it's fun to fight. It's fun to fight these creeps. I mean, it's fun to just fun to do what you can against them. But I, I, I always try to copy Murray Rothbard in this, who said he was a short-term pessimist and a long-term optimist. And it was his feeling that the Industrial Revolution had unleashed forces that the state would ultimately not be able to control, uh, that commerce um, uh, would outrun the state, and that um, if we just see what's happened you know, with, with the Internet, um, is there any question in anybody's mind that if the state had seen what was coming with the internet, they would have outlawed it? <laughs> but they didn't see it. They're too stupid. <laughs> they didn't see what was coming. Now, of course, they're taxing it or want to tax it. Now they want to run it and so forth. But uh, I think the, uh, what gives me hope is the market. What gives me hope is young people like in this room. Uh, and when I first got into this, I can tell you I felt like the only non-communist on campus. Um, but today, you know, not only George Mason, but at hundreds of uh, American colleges and universities and hundreds more around the world, there are huge um, cells of students interested in these kinds of ideas. And, um, you know, we, we can't do much about the, the, um, the uh, reigning forces within the economics profession or other, other academic disciplines, but students, students are changing. Um, so I think that I, I guess also the, the unbelievable stupidity of the state gives me hope. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I, I always think of it like a, like a, uh, a, a rabid, a huge rabid dog that's blind. And maybe it's on a chain, too. So it's always going around snapping and stamping. And if you get in the jaws, that's the end of you. Or if it steps on you with a big foot, that's the end of you, too. But it is possible not to be st stepped on. And um, I think that's the market. I mean, I think the market is outrunning the state. And uh, so I think, uh, but I don't, you know, so, but I think we also need intellectuals, obviously, besides commerce. And, um, you know, that's people dedicated to the right sorts of ideas. So the combination of what's, of capitalism and libertarianism, that's what gives me hope. Uh, Lou, one of my favorite things about your website is uh, how much uh, military or former military writers that you have that come up, that show up on there, mm -hmm. especially people like Fred Reed and whatnot. Um, could you give us uh, any indication as to what your military readership is like from people who are currently over in these places overseas? Do do people are they reading your site and are they able to get to your site? I, I get a huge amount of mail from soldiers in Iraq and Afghanistan. And even though the, the um, military tries to shut, them, shut, up, shut down the site, 
I mean, in the sense that they're not trying to shut down the site, not yet anyway, but they try to uh, block the site. Um, still, there are ways around it, and they, f and, you know, they find ways around it. So there's a lot of interest. Um, you'd be amazed at the number of people I hear from who say, you know, I used to believe in all this stuff, now I don't.